Biden administration issues new immigration directive to curb family separation. Biden says he would go to war with Iran as last resort. Forced, coerced sterilization of women in Canada continues. Indian Supreme Court refuses to stop house demolitions. New leader must tackle Islamophobia within UK ruling party, Mossad's Muslim group. Salam Festival celebrates Muslim culture with two concerts. From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hanna Zuberi. Our top story tonight. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement released a new immigration directive governing the detention of minors, incapacitated adults, and their guardians. It will replace the Trump-era order dealing with migrant minors and their families, which has been in force since April 2017. The latest directive was created in response to the Trump administration's controversial family separation policy. Reports say that led to children being separated from their parents for years. The new measure requires ICE officials to ask detainees or non-citizens their parental status. It also requires that if a parent or guardian must be detained, this is done in a facility conducive to visitation, if appropriate. On Wednesday, House Republicans rejected a measure arguing the Pentagon and federal law enforcement agencies to publish a report on countering white supremacist and neo-Nazi activity in their ranks. U.S. Representative Brad Schneider, an Illinois Democrat, proposed an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023. It directs the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and Department of Defense to publish the report. It would analyze and set out strategies to combat white supremacist and neo-Nazi activity in the uniformed forces and federal law enforcement agencies. The measure passed in the party line 218 to a 208 vote. The House is expected to pass the full NDAA this week. A grand jury has indicted a 19-year-old man accused of carrying out a devastating mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, with federal hate crimes and firearms charges. Peyton Gendron faces 14 hate crime charges, including 10 counts resulting in death and 13 firearm offenses. This is in connection to the May 14th mass shooting targeting African Americans at a Topps grocery store. The grand jury indictment alleges Gandron ent entered the supermarket and opened fire with a Bushmaster XM rifle. He's accused of killing 10 black victims and injuring three others. Gandron allegedly planned the attack for months. He selected the grocery store because it was in an area with the highest concentration of black residents. Attorney General Merrick Garland vowed in June to be relentless in Justice Department's efforts to hold accountable those who perpetuate hate crimes. On Wednesday, Indiana's Republican Attorney General sparked widespread outrage after launching an investigation into a doctor who recently provided legal abortion care to a child rape victim. A 10-year-old girl raped in Ohio was sent to Indiana to be treated because of Ohio's anti-abortion law. The Indiana doctor, Caitlin Bernard, who treated the girl, is now being investigated and faces criminal penalties. Indiana Attorney General Todd Rokita announced the probe on Fox News' Jesse Walters' primetime late Wednesday. The show was among the media outlets initially casting doubt on the child's story. Washington Post columnist Radley Balco said by airing the doctor's photo, the show's producers are actively trying to get her killed or just don't care that they're putting her in danger. On Wednesday, U.S. Representative Ilhan Omar 
warned that a provision of the National Defense Authorization Act would bar the Pentagon from distributing aid to Afghans. Afghanistan is engulfed in a massive humanitarian emergency after two decades of deadly U.S. occupation. It's facing one of the most horrific humanitarian crises on the planet, said Omar, a Minnesota Democrat. Omar, a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, tweeted that the U.S. should do everything in its power to deliver humanitarian assistance to Afghans. The House version of the $839 billion NDAA would prohibit Defense Department funds from being used to transport currency or other items of value to the Taliban. The legislation could pass with bipartisan approval as soon as this week. U.S. President Joe Biden said in an interview Wednesday that he would be willing to go to war with Iran to prevent the country from obtaining a nuclear weapon. That position drew condemnation from advocacy groups and foreign policy analysts who questions its moral, strategic, and legal basis. Biden said he's committed to keeping the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps on the U.S. State Department's foreign terror terrorist organizations list. That's even if it means sinking the prospects of a deal to revive the nuclear accord. He acknowledged former President Donald Trump's decision to abandon the seven-country deal in 2018 was a gigantic mistake. On Thursday, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi warned of a harsh and regrettable response after U.S. and Israeli leaders issued a joint declaration against Iran. Raisi said the interventions of foreign powers in the region only result in crisis and destabilization. He described Iran's military power as a security factor. Raisi's remarks came shortly after President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid reaffirmed their resolve to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Israel has possessed nuclear weapons since the 1960s. However, it has never officially confirmed the existence of his nuclear program. Raisi said that some of the countries in the region have become transits of insecurity and terrorism. He added that Iran will not accept insecurity and crisis in the region. Forced coerced sterilization of women in Canada continues. Details after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Mr. Speaker, if I decide to wear a turban, or you decide to wear a cross, or he decides to wear a kippah or a skullcap, or she decides to wear a hijab or a burqa, does that mean that it is open season for right honourable members of this House to make derogatory and divisive remarks about our appearance? For those of us who from a young age have had to endure and face up to being called names such as Towelhead or Taliban, or coming from Bongo Bongo land, we can appreciate full well the hurt and pain felt by already vulnerable Muslim women when they are described as looking like bank robbers and letterboxes. So, so rather than hide behind sham and whitewash investigations, when will the Prime Minister finally apologise for his derogatory and racist remarks? Which Go 
racist, racist remarks, Mr Speaker, which have led to a spike in hate crime. Yeah. And given the increasing prevalence of yeah. such incidents within his party, when will the Prime Minister finally order an inquiry into Islamophobia within the Conservative Party, something which he and his Chancellor promised on national television? Yeah. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. It's Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. To stop this genocide, we need your help. Welcome back. Forcing women to undergo sterilization to prevent future births is an ongoing practice in Canada, often affecting indigenous and black women and women with disabilities. That's according to a report released Thursday by the Canadian Senate. The report contains 13 recommendations, including making the horrific practice, it quoted, a criminal offense and an apology and compensation to victims. Forced and coerced sterilization has been used as a strategy to subjugate and eliminate First Nations, Metis, and Inuit people, the report said. Other vulnerable groups disproportionately subjected to these procedures include black and racialized women, persons with disabilities, intersex children, and institutionalized persons, the report said. The new British Prime Minister must treat systematic Islamophobia in the ruling Conservative Party seriously, the head of UK's leading Muslim group said. The party is searching for outgoing Pr Premier Boris Johnson's successor. Whoever wins must represent everybody and make sure they do it fairly, said Zara Mohammed, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. Mohammed emphasized the need for a commitment to zero tolerance on Islamophobia. Party leadership must make clear such behavior is totally unacceptable, she added. More than 30, 300 cases of Islamophobia have been documented. Senior members of the party have complained about the problem, she said. Muslim art and culture will be featured on a day of two groundbreaking concerts on July 24th in Manchester. Grammy award-winning artist Aruj Aftab will be giving a world premiere performance during the Salam Festival at the Albert Hall. Festival organizers say the vision is to put on original new work and bring together Muslim artists who cross genres and boundaries. The program includes a world premiere performance of Iqbal by composer Rushil Ranjan. The piece is set to the Urdu poetry of Muhammad Iqbal, a South Asian Muslim writer, philosopher, and politician. Fatima Payman was elected to the sixth seat in the Western Australian Senate last month. The 27-year-old is the first Afghan refugee and woman in hijab in the Australian Senate. She hopes to represent the Labour Party and to make her late father proud. Payman's father died in 2018 after a long battle with leukemia. He was an organizer for the United Workers Union. Payman said that her father was a fan of the Labour Party and believed that representation mattered. She believes such representation is long overdue. Payman is thought the first Muslim in the Australian government. 
Others are Mehreen Farooqi in the Senate, Anne Ali, Minister of Early Childhood Education and Minister for Youth, and Ed Hosik, Husich, Minister for Industry and Science. On Wednesday, the Indian Supreme Court declined to stop the demolition of Muslim-owned properties nationwide. Muslim organization Jamiat Ulema Hind is seeking a directive to stop them until the apex court decides on its petition alleging violation of people's rights. Senior advocate Dushyant Dave argued the problem is that Muslims alone are being targeted in these demolition drives. In recent months, different state governments have been bulldozing the houses of Muslim leaders and activists without due process, a hearing, or court orders. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, you could be me for just one hour. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back. To discuss President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia, let's go to Edward Ahmed Mitchell. Over to you, Edward. Thank you, Hannah. And now we move to the Middle East. As you all know, President Biden is visiting the Middle East right now, in particular Israel and Saudi Arabia, as well as Palestine. And we want to discuss today his trip, the impact of his trip on the region, on American foreign policy and people around the world. To discuss this important topic, I'm very happy to welcome on our guest, Sami Hamdi, who is the Managing Director of the International Interest and he's a popular uh, political commentator on the MENA region. We're so happy to have him here with, you, with us. Thank you, Sami. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. All good. Hope you're well. Thank you. Thank you. So let me start by asking you this. You know, uh, President Biden has, has been to Israel, Palestine. He's in Saudi Arabia now. What were you expecting to happen during this trip? And has anything surprised you so far? I don't think there's anything on the trip that's necessarily been surprising. We all knew that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, would take full advantage 
of Biden's trip to Saudi Arabia. We saw the picture of the fist bump between the crown prince and between Biden. Whilst it wasn't a handshake, Bin Salman got the photo that he wanted, a photo that shows that he's not especially pleased with Biden and that Biden is the one coming to visit him looking for some sort of reprieve with regards to gas prices. Bin Salman also got the photo that he's looking for in terms of the meeting that took place between Biden's delegation and between Mohammed bin Salman, noting that Biden before had said that he would not deal with Mohammed bin Salman, but would only deal with the head of state, King Salman. Bin Salman got his photo in which he's sitting opposite Biden with his team, and they sat for two hours and 55 minutes. So as far as the PR stuff is concerned, there's no surprise on that particular front. There's no surprise regarding the dynamics of this trip, the idea being that Biden tried everything not to go to Saudi Arabia and that he's gone to Saudi Arabia after having been strong-armed by the Saudis, strong-armed by the Israelis, strong-armed by the UAE, uh, and other and, and essentially that regional alliance that is uh, forming. So in terms of actual surprise or the like, I think there's no surprise that it's going as was expected, a humbled US president going to Saudi Arabia to ask for some reprieve regarding energy prices and hoping to take back some sort of foreign policy achievement that Biden hopes will look like in the form of some increasing step towards normalization of ties that Saudi Arabia has suggested it will do. Today it announced that its airspace will be open to all uh, airline carriers without specifically naming Israel, but the statement is designed to allow Israel now to use uh, Saudi airspace for all flights and all routes. So is this a major change on Saudi Arabia's part? I mean, they, they do not maintain diplomatic relations with Israel. They uh, produced the 2002 Air Peace Initiative saying that there would be normalization in exchange for uh, peace and justice, freedom for the Palestinians. And they still, in theory, hold to that, correct? But what, how much of a change is this for Saudi Arabia to take the steps towards the Israeli government? Is this just putting out in public what's been going on in private for some time? If you put into YouTube and you find the interview of Hamad bin Jassim, the former Qatari prime minister, he gave an exclusive interview to France 24, a lengthy interview, an hour long, I think it is, in 2018. In that interview, he stated quite bluntly that, quote, when the Arabs get close to Israel and talk to Israel, it's not because they like the Israelis. It is because they believe that Israel is the key to the Congress and key to the White House. And this was something that Qatar understood in 96 when it established its own official, unofficial ties with Israel in exchange for the Americans preventing a Saudi invasion. It's the same uh, It's the same thinking or rationale behind UAE normalization of ties with Israel that has enabled it to navigate Biden's antagonism and force Biden to align more with the UAE as opposed to Qatar. And it's also the reasoning that we're seeing Saudi Arabia now flirt with the idea of normalization. The idea being that given that Washington has been antagonistic towards Saudi Arabia, towards Mohammed bin Salman, uh, flirting with the idea of normalization is a powerful enough tactic to get Biden to come to, Riyadh, to Jeddah, to come to Saudi Arabia and essentially offer concessions in the hope that somehow that might encourage some further normalization. Having said that, it's important to note that Mohammed bin Salman is very keen to secure Washington's approval to become king. And bin Salman has been embarking on a number of initiatives towards normalization, allowing Israeli sports teams to participate for the first time on kingdom territory and to allowing them to enter with Israeli passports. We know of reports of Israeli businessmen flying directly uh, to Saudi Arabia. We know Netanyahu thanked bin Salman, the Saudi crown prince, Netanyahu thanked him in a recording two days ago in which he stated that bin Salman uh, helped us to facilitate normalization of ties with Arab states, the point, the, i.e. the allusion here to UAE, Bahrain, Sudan and uh, Morocco. So bin Salman, it's may, it may not necessarily be that he intends to normalize ties in the near future, but certainly he believes that flirting with normalization of ties, dangling that in front of the Israelis, has certainly helped him to humble Biden, has certainly helped him to lobby the White House, has certainly helped him to navigate the pressure that Biden once sought to implement by calling him a pariah. But bin Salman would believe that Biden's visit today is the fruits of this flirtation with normalization of ties with Israel. Saudi won't normalize anytime soon, but certainly bin Salman has given enough indication that during his reign, there may be an official normalization of ties. Well, that brings us now to the, to the Israeli government. So uh, Biden first visited Israel and seemed to give a very full-throated endorsement of the Israeli government. 
uh, the Israeli system, uh, very little crumbs thrown to the Palestinian people. Um, what, what do you think uh, of that visit to Israel? Was that as um, unbalanced as you expected or par for the course? And uh, what do you think the Palestinian people will take away from this? From seeing an American president have this sort of reaction, uh, not even meet with the family of Shireen Abu Akleh. Uh, what, what did the Palestinian people do in a situation where Arab governments of the region are seemingly, you know, slowly turning their backs on them, some of them? Uh, the American president seems to have no interest in putting pressure on the Israeli government, and the Israeli government is going further and further to the right. What, what did the Palestinian people do in response to this? I think that what's important to highlight is that Biden's attitude reflects the reality of the situation, which is that Biden is not going to be more royal than royalty. If the Arabs are betraying the Palestinians, if the UAE is cutting its aid to Palestine, if Saudi is cutting its aid to Palestine, if Saudi and the UAE are bullying the King of Jordan in order to try to get him to share the custodianship of Jerusalem so that they might hand it over to Israel later on, if uh, uh, UAE is buying land from the Palestinians, as Hamad bin Jassim, the former Qatari prime minister, Minister suggested if UAE is buying land from the Palestinians and selling it to the Israelis in order to help Israel sell that demographic, if you're sitting in the White House, it's not exactly you're going to turn around to the Arabs and say, yo, what are you doing? Instead, you will be saying that the Arabs have moved on from the Palestinian cause. So let's continue to take more land. Let's support that apartheid regime. Let's support that colonization. The Palestinians have no one standing in their corner. And I think Biden's trip to Israel really reflected that sentiment, the idea in which he stated that it's not time for a new peace initiative, that the parties are not ready for it. But in this, he's telling the truth in that the parties are not ready for it. Israel believes there's no need to engage in peace talks and that it can continue expanding without impunity, while the Palestinians believe that it's not the time for peace talks, given they have no leverage to take anything from the Israelis uh, in any case. I think the reaction to Shireen Abu Akhla, I think it was very much in line with what Washington has been saying for the past few months since Shireen Abu Akhla died. The idea being that when Russians uh, kill journalists in Ukraine, Ned Price, the White House spokesman, put out a tweet that he was horrified, whereas when Shirin Abu Akhla was killed in cold blood, the U.S. ambassador to Israel said, we're sad and we hope to see an investigation. I think Biden reflected this attitude in that even if Shirin Abu Akhla was, uh, was an American citizen, she, even though she was Christian, she remains a foreigner, she remains uh, an Arab, and Biden therefore believes that, that must, that's not necessarily worth throwing the kitchen sink at Israel uh, for. In terms of your question in terms of what do the Palestinians do, the reality is quite bluntly, bluntly that the Palestinians have achieved a number of victories over the past year that suggest that they have momentum on their side. The reality is that in the last Gaza war, Palestinian activists through social media imposed a new terminology in terms of how the world talks about Palestine. Amnesty now uses the word apartheid. Human rights now uses the word apartheid. Apartheid is now used on the Congress floor. The Nicholas Kristof, a prominent journalist, wrote in the New York Times that the relationship between Israel and the US is no longer unshakable. These are all victories that we're seeing in recent times, suggesting that even if the Arabs are moving away from the Palestinian cause, the Palestinians themselves continue to lift this cause and raise the flag and continue to keep it alive. And I think the reality is that the Israelis themselves, when you look at the election campaign, and I'll finish on this point, when you look at the election campaign, the debate amongst the Israeli parties is that they are still facing an existential threat, primarily because they believe that the impasse with regards to the Palestinians and communication with the Palestinians threatens a revolutionary movement, threatens a revolutionary war that Israel believes is not best equipped to handle at this particular time, particularly in a multipolar world where the global order appears to be falling apart, as reflected in the Ukraine war. So, Sammy, you know, we, we know that only Allah knows the future, uh, but I will ask you this question. Based on where things are going right now, President Biden's visit, upcoming fifth Israeli election, Mahmoud Abbas is, is uh, you know, getting up there in age. You know, if we uh, look up five years from now, 10 years from now at this region, what, do you, what are you expecting in terms of the trends of where this thing is going? What do you expect to see five or 10 years from now in terms of Israel, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, the United States role in the region, or is it just completely up in the air? There's there's no way to tell. Even the trends we're seeing don't mean anything because the region can change on a dime so quickly. Do you have any expectations for the next 10 years? 
I think there are two dynamics that are worth looking at. The first is a tweet that was put out by one of the most prominent UAE commentators a few months back, Abdul Khalik Abdullah, who was a former advisor, of course, to the leadership in the UAE. Abdul Khalik Abdullah put out a tweet in which he said that, quote, when we, the UAE, were offered F-15s uh, from the US and 5G from China, we preferred the 5G from China over the F-15s from the US because the future is now in the East. The reality is that for all of the talk about America in the region and Biden going to try to shore up his ties with US allies, there is a belief amongst US allies in the region that the US is no longer a reliable partner and it's time to diversify relationships and diversify alliances. And that's why Qatar, Saudi, UAE and the likes have not compromised their relationship with Russia. Saudi has recently imported cheap Russian fuel in preparation for an increase in production to appease uh, Biden or to offer a concession to Biden. But the point being here is that the region is clearly moving away from the security framework that's been underpinned by Biden, given that the US wants to withdraw and the US public no longer has an appetite for foreign policy adventures. The second dynamic is a more broader contextual one, which is that when you ask about the next five to 10 years, it's important to remember that 80 years ago, this region was under official colonization. Algeria, where my mother is from, the French flag was raising high on all of the schools in Algeria. When France got its freedom in 1945 in World War II from Nazism, France uh, essentially massacred Algerians who asked for their own freedom. But nevertheless, in 1962, Algeria got its freedom, Tunisia got its freedom, Morocco got its freedom, the region was liberated from official colonization, and then we entered a period of semi-colonization. But the point here is official colonization could no longer be implemented. Fast forward from semi-colonization, we saw the Arab Spring, another chapter in the struggle for self-determination, the struggle for some sort of rights, freedom, integrity, uh, and, and the like. In other words, what we're seeing, if we're comparing it over the past 70 years, is a progression towards liberation, progression towards freedom, progression towards justice, even if the journey has been hard. And this is why when it comes to Palestine and Israel, and you alluded to that in terms of the next five to 10 years, Algeria was colonized 132 years, and it took a five-year war at the end to finally kick out France. Palestine has been 82 years or 83 years. It still has 50 years before it catches up to Algeria. But the point being is that the darkest point of the night is just before dawn. As long as these narratives are alive, and that's why I pointed to the victories that the Palestinians have achieved in imposing the correct terminology or the use of the correct terminology on the crisis, the fact that the now established organizations are using the word apartheid, all of this suggests is that we're progressing. And even if we don't see the victory in our lifetimes, all things suggest that we're certainly headed in the right direction for the liberation, even if perhaps it will be a very difficult struggle along the way. So the direct answer to your question is, it may get worse before it gets better. We may see normalization of ties between Saudi and Israel, but that doesn't mean that this will be a new status quo. Once the British Empire was an empire where the sun never set, it fell only in the last century. We're living in a new global order. There's nothing to suggest we won't see a very different one in the next 20, 30, 40, even 100 years. But certainly we're going towards change, and that change will certainly be for the better. But the price, of course, may be high. We shall see one way or another, inshallah. Uh, Sammy, th thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate this insight. And uh, obviously, the news will continue to break and develop about this trip and other uh, developments in the region. So we look forward to having you back to continue the discussion, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we'll send it back to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Edward. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.